Let's get to the meat of the matter and finally decide what is the best steak for summer grilling today on the Carefree Cook's Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore and this is the Carefree Cook's Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cook's Code, everyone. We are live together every Tuesday at noon Eastern. If you're surprised by this fact, uh, then you should have gone to webcookingclasses.com slash live and gotten involved with my alert system. Uh, there we go. Microphone is not... It's not playing nice today. Hey, we're live every Tuesday. I love it uh, when we get together because we're the carefree cooks, right? We create our own recipes. We bring friends and family together. We learn every time we cook an important distinction. We define our own cooking styles because we practice pro methods and we love our cooking. And, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, I love looking. I love Tuesdays. I really look forward to this day uh, because we get to spend 30 minutes together. Uh, and I really appreciate it. I, I really appreciate the kind comments. Uh, that everyone is sending. Let's see who's with us today. That's good. Uh, John is with us. Welcome, John and Terry and Nancy. And uh, Bob uh, is Taco Tuesday. Okay, yeah, that sounds good to me. Gail is with us. Teresa and Candy and Peter and Carrie and Jerry and all our friends are with us on Tuesdays. They know every Tuesday at noon live is the Carefree Cooks Code. And, you know, thank you so much for all your kind comments. Thank you for all your encouragement to keep going. I, I got, you know, my birthday week, I got so much just an outpouring of, of, of such love and kindness that people were saying to me. I appreciate it so much. All the things that you say, the Chef Todd, you know, I now figured out how to do this. I now uh, I can do this. And my family came together. We had this great meal or uh, a lot of people saying I did this in celebration of you. And that was really cool as well. Microphone. There we go. Uh, but look, no, don't worry. I'm not retiring anytime soon. We're going to keep doing this as long as you enjoy it, as long as you get something out of it. That's why I do this. I do it for you because we have a lot of fun together. Oh, and speaking of which, I've got a true or false for you today. There it is. Uh, tell me in the comment section below, true or false. Searing a steak seals in the juices. I know you've heard this. Is this a true food statement or a false food? food statement. Tell me in the comments below. Look, I'm so glad to be home. I'm back here at Moore Publishing Headquarters, downtown, steamy, Baltimore, Maryland. It's been like 100 degrees here. And again, thank you so much for all your birthday wishes that you sent me. Thank you so much for all the things that you cooked for me. Uh, those were some of the best gifts that I got for my birthday, the things that, that you cooked for me virtually. So thank you so much. And you know, I love my birthday because it's smack in the middle of the summer. And sometimes I wind up with a birthday beard that will go away. And we all know that summer cooking is cool, right? It's really cool to cook in the summer when you do it right. The cooking method that is most associated with summer and the cooking method that is usually done wrong is grilling. And look, we've covered the 11 steps in the grilling method before. I'm not going to cover that today. There are other videos. You can search my YouTube or, or my Facebook pages. Uh, for, we've done tons of past grilling videos, uh, videos that you'll see from my backyard, uh, grilling at my own house, videos that you'll see from the Culinary College Lab, and pretty much they'll be the same because I teach grilling the same no matter who I'm helping to be a better griller, a professional or a home cook. It's pretty much the same. And you know, I mean, that's my big pet peeve. Like, why, why is cooking taught differently to home cooks than it is in culinary school? But I'm not getting on that soapbox today either. Today, it is all about what to cook. 
Now, <laughs> you might be interested to know that there recently was a meeting of the Board of Directors of Moore Publishing Incorporated, DBA, webcookingclasses.com. My lawyer told me I had to say that. Well, you know, these meetings that we have, the Board of Directors gets together and we try to identify the ways that we can create even more carefree cooks, right? How we can further our mission of helping everyone to improve their lifestyle through better food and cooking. And at this particular board meeting with the entire board of directors, <laughs> man, we made some really cool plans for the next 12 months. I am bursting not to tell you what we came up with. And there is one in particular that's going to create an absolute frenzy in our community, <laughs> but it's in the planning stages. I, I just, I can't tell you about it yet. I will, I will. But anyway, back to the story. So the entire board of directors uh, sat at a table for two <laughs> in a really nice restaurant in downtown Baltimore. Yes, Heather and I, the board of directors, we decided to map out the future at the Prime Rib Steakhouse in Baltimore. And look, I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm really not a fan of the, the steakhouse concept. You know, the Ruth Chris's, the Shula's, things like that. You know the place. You order everything separately. You wind up getting like a small village's worth of asparagus for $15 on the side, you know, and then your one little steak in the middle. Anyway, not a big fan, but I hadn't had a good steak in a while. I got to be honest with you. Heather and I, we've been eating a lot of fish. We've been eating a lot of shellfish. You've seen we've been traveling to places where the fish are. Uh, and it's been months. I mean, months since I've had a good steak. And since we're going to a steakhouse, I figured I better order a steak. I should have worn, you like my shirt? There we go. It's a appropriate shirt for today. <laughs> I should have worn this shirt, but of course they, they dress a lot nicer there. Well, let me tell you. I ordered the steak from the steakhouse. <gasps> oh, my God. Goodness, it was so good with each bite, like caramely, charcoaly, you know, crusty, cracked pepper. Every time that the, you know, the crocodile Dundee sized steak knife they give you, every time that crocodile Dundee knife just like fell through the steak, it, I mean, it was that tender. And it got me thinking about everything that goes into making a steak this good. Now, can you make a steak like the steakhouse? Look, first of all, they're a steakhouse, okay? They make hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of steaks. They got a lot of experience that you may not have with steaks. And they've got a method. I guarantee you they do the same thing over and over again to make these steaks. They, they use a repeatable method. It's something that we talk about all the time. Plus, I know they got a really friggin' hot grill back there. I mean, a grill so much hotter than anything that I could use in my house. And they've got this process, which I don't need to share with you now. But it, suffice it to say they're getting the best steaks from the best ranches um, they're seasoning them correctly. They age them dry, age them lovingly. They serve it perfectly. <laughs> you know, so how do I get this at home? And, and there I am. I'm, blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting there in this vegetarian's nightmare, eyes rolling back in my head, being so grateful for everything that it takes to grill a steak this good because it is so closely associated with summer. And you know, with every bite, I thought about you. I, I thought about everybody with us today. I thought about all the carefree cooks. I mean, this steak was so good that I just knew that this would be what I wanted to share with you this week. This is what I would want to talk about because <laughs> my goal for this summer is I want you to remember this summer. 2019, I want you to remember this summer as the time that you were able to grill the perfect steak and be really, really proud of yourself. Because every summer, this question comes at me like waves on the beach, <laughs> crashing over my head. It's again and again and again. And the question is, Chef Todd, what's the best steak to grill? Chef Todd, what's the best steak to grill? Like waves on the beach. Comes up with me every day. And you know, it's really funny because nobody sends me a note that says, Chef Todd, what's the best squash to roast in the fall? <laughs> you know? Nobody says, Chef Todd, what's the best fruit to make jam out of in the spring? Or what's the best root vegetable to braise 
in the winter, <laughs> more people are so concerned about what goes on the grill rather than the grilling process. But look, once the outdoor cooking begins, then everybody starts to think that if they could just come up with that one amazing steak, right? There is such a focus on this, the perfect, exotic, marinated, aged, tenderized, milk-fed, grass-raised, non-GMO, free-range, gluten-free, larded, barded, antibiotic-free, hormone-free, humanely treated steak. If they could get this one steak, then they're instantly a great griller. <laughs> well, look, all those multisyllabic words that I just used, they, they can be important when you talk about the source of your food, right? Deciding what's important to you of where the, the cow is. But no matter where the source, where your cow comes from, what it ate, how it was raised, how it was treated, where your steak came from on the cow can mean great grilling or chewy charcoal. So that's where we're going to change our focus today. Let's talk about the cuts of steak on the cow, not necessarily where the cow is. And this is a topic that we spend three full days on in culinary school, but today I've got less than 20 minutes <laughs> to bring it all to you. So let's get going. Here it is. Uh, let's talk about beef from a cow. I'll give it the basic definition. Beef from a cow is edible muscle tissue, fat, connective tissue, and bones, all right? Let's just generally, uh, edit something you can eat, the fat, some of it you can, the connective tissue, some of it cooks, some of it doesn't, and the bones, which of course you don't eat. But the muscle tissue, this is something most people don't understand. It's 72% water, 20% protein, 7% fat, and 1% minerals. And here's where part of the, the focus goes awry, because most home cooks, most backyard grillers, are focusing on the 20%. Most backyard grillers right here <laughs> are focusing on the protein, on cooking the protein. But a professional griller, a real pro in culinary school, is focusing on the 72%, is focusing on retaining the water. That's three quarters of the steak. Shouldn't that be where your focus goes, is retaining the water rather than trying to char the protein? And any single muscle on a cow is being held together by bundles of muscle cells or fibers by connective tissue. And the size of these bundles dictates the grain and the texture of the meat. So when the cow starts to fatten, some of the water and the proteins are replaced by fat. As the cow gets bigger, as the cow gets older, the 72% of water starts to appear as marbling. And this is what you know as marbling in the final cut of the meat. So the older the animal, the more marbling you're going to find given the same diet as a younger cow. So this connective tissue binds the muscle cells into bundles. This is what allows the cow to walk. This is what allows you to walk, for that matter. You're, you're a protein and water product just like a cow is. And most connective tissue is composed of two types uh, of connect, uh, is two types of connective tissue, either collagen or elastin. Now, collagen is the one that breaks down under heat. Collagen breaks into gelatin and water when cooked in a moist heat or cooked in some kind of moisture. This is how we make stocks. The collagen is what breaks down into gelatin, and it's what gives you your jiggly beef stock. This is the good part, okay? This is the good connect connective tissue, but the elastin does not break down under normal cooking conditions. It's got to be removed before you cook it. Ah, knife skills, right? You want to know why I focus on knife skills so much because this is the first way that you can make a steak tender or chewy before it ever winds up going on the grill. You pick a cut with more elastin, I'm sorry, with more collagen than elastin. More elastin, chewier, it won't cook down unless you cut it away. More collagen, you're going to have a more tender steak. So really our goal in cooking meats is to follow the four effects of heat on food. The goal is to coagulate the proteins, watch it stiffen and shrink. You want to break down these connective tissues, which ultimately tenderizes 
the steak, you're rendering fats, rendering that marbling in there, tenderizing the steak, and you want to caramelize sugars to give it that nice brown color, the sweet flavor, and the nice grill marks on your steak. Basically, that's just the three things that you're trying to do. Coagulate, tenderize, and caramelize. But there's this other one that I mentioned before, and that is retaining the moisture preventing that 72% from escaping. And this is where we're using combination cooking methods. This is where your steak at the prime rib is grill marked early in the day, put in the refrigerator, and I guarantee you, finished in the oven. I, I don't think they do too much grilling once service comes. But which cut of steak you choose has a huge impact on whether you're a great griller or not because of these things, because of the goals of what you're trying to accomplish, and because of the elastin, the collagen, and the muscle fiber. So let's talk real quickly about how a cow is processed. Now a steer is first cut in half, cut lengthwise down the backbone, and then it's cut across the 12th, in between the 12th and 13th rib. So it leaves one rib on one side, 12 ribs on the other, and this creates four quarters. Four, F-O-U-R down the middle, and then across the half. Four pieces, F-O-U-R. And there are two four quarters, F-O-R-E, meaning the front, and two hind quarters from the back. Now, this is how the cow gets slaughtered. You, you, of course, you're not going to your grocery store or your butcher and buying a quarter cow. That's 500 pounds worth of cow when you get home, unless, of course, you're Fred Flintstone. So Fred, you know, always was buying those big cuts of meat. Your processor is going to take those four quarters and is going to create what they call primal cuts of beef. And from the four quarter, you get chuck, brisket and shank, rib, and short plate. And then from the hind quarter, you get the short loin, the sirloin, the flank, and the round but you're still probably not buying primal cuts at your grocery store or your farmer's market because your car would probably tip over like Fred Flintstone. Anytime I can get Fred Flintstone in twice, I'm a, he never learned, did he? Every time the car flipped over, guy never learned. But your butcher, he learns because from these primal cuts of beef, your local butcher is going to create fabricated cuts. And these fabricated cuts, these are where you get your steaks your chops, your roasts, the things that wind up on a styrofoam tray and get wrapped in plastic in some stores. But uh, blah, 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 Todd, I know. That still doesn't answer the question of what is the best steak for grilling. I want to give you a little background information. Okay, like I said, this is a 15-hour course at culinary school, so I need to get to the meat of the matter here. Here's a few ideas for you to graze on. I'm going to give you a few rules of thumb. First, the more the muscle moves, the tougher the meat. If you can remember that, if you can remember this picture of the cow here, and remember the more the muscle moves, the tougher the meat, that's going to make it easier for you to choose your steak right off the bat. The second is the more marbling you see, the older the cow will be. Because just a minute ago, I told you the marbling is the water that as the cow fattens in age, turns into fat intramuscularly different than a chicken, which is extra muscularly. Chicken stores its fat under the skin above the muscle. That'll be another day. So the more marbling you see, the older the cow. But, you know, a lot of times people say the older the cow, the more flavorful the meat. Others say the tougher the meat. It all depends on the cut. And lastly, the longer the muscle, the tougher the steak is going to be. And I'll explain that in a minute. Some muscles on the cow are short. Others run all the way down the back leg. They're longer. So here's the way to think about this. A cow walks on four legs. Duh. It's obvious. And the more the muscle moves, the tougher the meat. This is why chuck is ground into burgers. Right? I don't suggest grilling a chuck steak. You, you would braise or roast a chuck steak, maybe in tomato sauce or an acidic item to, to tenderize it and break down the connective tissue. All right, let's think about those front legs, those scrawny little front legs on a cow. They hold up a lot of weight. They do a lot of work. They're really skinny. They have a lot of tendons. They have a lot of connective tissue. They have a lot of elastin. And this is why you don't hear about a great grilled beef shank. Right? Shanks are braised over a long period of time. Shanks are co cooked again in acidic liquid. 
So those are not good choices to grill. If you want to know what the best steak for grilling is, now we've already eliminated two of them. Don't take anything from the shoulders forward. Anything near the head is not going to be good for you. All right, let's move on to the rear of the cow. That rump. <laughs> that, is it a little too close to me? Uh, all right. That rump, man, it holds up a lot of weight, right? Steaks from the round aren't really good choices to grill because grilling is, is quick in intense method of cooking, right? And in an intense, direct, conductive method of cooking, there's no time to be tender. I think that was an Elvis song. No time to be tender when you're grilling. There's no time to... I just made that up. It's not an Elvis song. And I meant Elvis Costello, by the way. Um, th there's no time to tenderize on the grill. So these tougher cuts of steak where, again, the muscle moves more. Remember, muscle moves more. You don't want to grill a steak from the round. So that leaves the middle of the cow. The middle top and the middle bottom of the cow. So let's start talking about the short plate. The short plate and the flank, these are abdominal cuts. Now the abdom abdomen is really, really lean. There's less marbling in the abdomen. These are longer striated muscles. There's less fat, but there is more connective tissue. And this is where you're going to find a little bit more elastin than collagen. And if you've ever had to clean a flank steak, which I've done hundreds of them, I can't even tell you, uh, between my catering company and culinary school. But look, if you've ever cleaned a flank steak, you can see that, that shiny silver skin that wraps around the muscle. It doesn't cook away. Uh, you can't digest it very well. So your knife skills are the only way to solve the problem of abdominal cuts of short plate and flank. But once you remove that connective tissue, these can be really great cuts of meat to cook. Now, the muscles are longer, like I said, and it can be really chewy. And this is why a flank steak or a bavette steak or a short plate is a better steak to cut across the grain rather than with the grain of the meat. Because there's a whole discussion on this about across the grain or with the grain. You always want to make sure that you're cutting your steak across the grain of the meat because the muscle fibers are, here we go, the muscle fibers are like rubber bands. Like imagine this is the muscle fiber of the cow. Let's fold it in half. There we go. Uh, there we go. This is the muscle fiber of the cow, right? So now if you take the whole flank steak with the muscle fibers going that way, and you slice across the muscle fibers, it's like trying to bite across the fibers of the uh, rubber band. But what if you took the ends of the rubber band and you sliced across the ends? Now you've got these much shorter, much shorter strands of, of uh, rubber band, if you will, or muscle fiber, and it makes the steak a lot more tender. So flank is the primal cut that you will find this, but if you find a bavette steak, a flat iron steak, they're all really good for the grill, but they need a little bit of tenderizing help. So these are great steaks to marinate in an acidic ingredient, start to break down those connective tissues. These abdominal steaks, great for the grill, but they really need to be marinated, dry rubbed, and a lot of knife skills to put on it. And you might notice uh, also, that you don't really grill short ribs or like beef rib, right? N normally, you grill mark them and then you smoke them or poach them or steam them, or, uh, simmer them in beer, braise them or roast them. They, all these things I just mentioned, indirect cooking methods, right? So a longer, tougher, more connective tissue cut of beef is probably going to be better for a moist convective cooking method to, to soften it up first, and then you can go ahead and grill mark it. Uh, anything from the short plate is also going to be really fatty. It, it's got a, a lot of connective tissue, too. It's just too much to go straight on the grill. It needs usually some kind of prep. So that leaves the top middle of the cow, and this is the place we want to be. These are the muscles that the cow uses the least. These are your best Steaks for grilling right here. Cuts from the rib, cuts from the short loin, cuts from the sirloin. They're the most tender. They're the best marbled. They're the least connective tissue muscles on the animal. And these are also the cuts that are usually sliced into steaks across the fiber into usable portions. So, right, you get a T-bone steak. 
A T-bone steak compared to a flank steak, the flank steak is the whole muscle, long muscle, like I just demonstrated. T-bone steaks are a sliced cross-section from the sirloin. A, a, a filet mignon, a tenderloin steak, is a sliced cross-section across the tenderloin. So this is, this is immediately going to be more tender. Your T-bone is a strip steak and a piece of the tenderloin. And this is where sirloin steaks come from. I saw a lot of comments about ribeye steaks. This is where your ribeye steaks come from. This is where your filet mignon, your beef tenderloin, comes from. This is the most tender muscle that runs along the spine of the cow from the sirloin primal cut. And it's also some of the most expensive. So this is what I want you to remember. This is what I want you to get out of all of this. The more the muscle moves, the tougher the cut of beef. Generally, look for things from the rib with the name rib in the cut, from the sirloin, sirloin cuts, or from the short loin, where you will find loin cuts, loin in the name. Rib, loin, sirloin might be your best cuts along with tenderloin. Of course, tenderloin has loin in the name. Those are the best cuts, you know? But now, if a cow uh, walked on two legs instead of four, all right, just imagine this for a minute because this is my evil plan. If a cow walked on two legs instead of four, everything would be completely different. The tenderloin would be the chewiest cut on the animal because it would have to support the spine. It would have to support all that weight up on two legs. It's like us. You know, if you're going to, I'm not, I'm not going to make that joke. It's too, it's too horrible. <laughs> what I'm saying is that the chuck and the brisket would probably be the most tender on my my mutant stand up on two legs cow because they don't use their shoulders that much, right? Those, those little arms, they, they, they're not, it's not like they're going to smoke, right? They, they, they're not going to drink tea. So the front arms aren't going to be used much. The chuck and the brisket would suddenly become the most tender flavor. So the, this is my mad scientist goal. I'm going to develop cows that walk on two legs. That way, the largest cut on the animal, that chuck, is going to be the most tender. I'm going to be rich, and I'm going to destroy the beef industry because I've got the... <laughs> they're all their cows are walking on two feet, and my new mutant cow... On four feet, and my mutant cow is walking on two. We're going to change the... Uh, no, I guess not. But it's not going to happen because until pigs fly, which would make pork tenderloin really tough and chewy, right? They'd be using those muscles. Until chickens fly which would make that very tender chicken breast that we all like taste more like duck. It would all be dark meat if chickens flew. Cows are still going to walk on four legs. And my evil plan is thwarted already. Four legs, that's all you got to remember, where the muscles that move the most make the worst cuts of meat for grilling. So look, you can focus on where your cow comes from, but if you want the best steaks for grilling, focus on where on the cow your steak comes from. Then you can start talking about dry rubs, marinades, injections, brining, larding, barding, all kinds of other stuff that goes along with grilling that can actually take any steak and make it the best steak to grill. As long as you use the right cut for the right method, you'll always be fine. Oh! From our uh, community of almost 9,000 carefree cooks, lifetime members of web cooking classes that make up our carefree cooks community on Facebook, let's see who's getting grilling. First, it's Paul. <laughs> Paul wrapped some uh, French green beans in bacon, put them on the grill. I love that idea. What a simple idea. Then I saw Paul took some asparagus wrapped it in bacon, put it on the grill. Cool idea for everyone to steal today. Uh, Michael knows how to take control of the heat in a grill pan, okay? Michael said it was a little hot outside, so he used the grill pan. And what I said was, man, you could play tic-tac-toe on that steak, right? Those grill marks are gorgeous. Uh, and this is a steak that, again, you slice up. Look how perfectly it's cooked in the middle. Nicely done, Michael, cutting across the grain to make the most tender steak. Uh, Marv smoked some ribs. But he said he wasn't happy with the results. But the thing that I loved about Marv's post, about his comment, he started listing all the things that he would do differently the next time. Look, grilling is not a magic trick. 
You know, just because you throw something on the grill and then you take it back off doesn't mean that you're a great griller. It takes trial and error and building confidence. And I love the fact that Har uh, Marv was talking about the methods that he's going to use next time, how he's going to change it for next time. Uh, John grilled some salmon, uh, served it with some corn relish. Gorgeous, man. Delicate fish can be a real challenge on the grill. You know, it sticks, it burns on one side before it cooks in the middle. Nicely done, John. Uh, Dan made some Korean chicken thighs. Look at that caramelization, that crunchy. Doesn't that, man, doesn't that just make your mouth water? Look at that little char on that chicken. Really nice. Nicely done. Really, really cool. Oh, uh, the true or false today. We were talking about this. Uh, searing a steak seals in the juices. Uh, I'm sorry, for those of you that said true, no, it's false. This is such an old wives' tale. Uh, there's nothing that seals in the juices. Uh, the only thing that can help your steak is trying to protect it during cooking. And one of the uh, step 11 in our 11 step grilling method is called bump and run. This is when you rest your steak. Let those juices redistribute. If you take a steak off the grill and put it right onto somebody's plate, that's when you get the bloody plate. The, the steak is still like letting some of those juices out. Let your steaks rest at least five minutes and then serve and oh my goodness never ever cut a steak open to see if it's done because then that's like cutting a hole in a hose you, you let all the moisture out uh, and if you know someone who's gashing steaks open <laughs> to, to see if they're done or not sure what all those names of be, uh, cuts of beef mean in the grocery store like this video share it with them because this can help them uh, grill some of the best steaks this summer and you know changing how you cook even changing what you cook, it's a big part of my five-step plan for cool summer cooking. And that's my free online class this week. It's Summer Cooking is Cool, Five Simple Steps to Lighter, Healthier Cooking. And if you'd like to see how I change my cooking for the seasons and make it even better, then hold your spot in my next class at webcookingclasses.com slash sun, S-U-N, and a Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your summer cooking success. See you next Tuesday, everyone. Bye-bye.